So in this video, we're going to take a look at a vital number for investors, earnings per share. It's a number that uh, analysts concentrate quite a lot of time on. It's a number that uh, the management of companies likes to try and get right because they know that many investors will use it as a guide to performance over time. So what is it? How many versions are there? And I'll be saying there are basically two. And is it useful? And the answer is, well, yes, it is, but you have to be careful. As with all accounting numbers, it's flawed. Okay, so what is earnings per share? Well, in essence, it does what it says on the tin. It's also known as EPS. It is one year's earnings, so that's profit after tax. Uh, we're not going to be taking away dividends, and that's simply because the directors make a decision about how they distribute profits after tax. Either they pay out a dividend or they don't, but that doesn't influence the earnings for the year. So we're going to ignore dividends, if you like, take profit after tax and divide by the number of ordinary shares, voting shares, if you will, in issue. And that's going to give us EPS, or earnings per share, in its what you might call basic form. OK, so the basic calculation is, on the face of it, straightforward. Um, what you would do, as an introduction, if you like, is simply take the profit after tax figure let's call that 10 million and divide it by the number of shares currently in issue. We'll say 100 million for this sort of simple example. And on that basis, EPS is going to come out as a number of pence or pounds even per share. So 10 million over 100 million is simply 10 pence or 10 pence per share. Now, by itself, that doesn't really tell you very much. Obviously, the higher the better from a shareholder's perspective, but it's useful to look at a trend, for example. So you might start to look back over the last three or four years and see how EPS has developed. The other use for it, uh, something we look at in a different video, is in a price-to-earnings multiple, um, because that multiple, used as a way of deciding whether a share is cheap or expensive, uses the current share price divided by the latest earnings per share figure. So, for example, the current share price is a pound. EPS, based on the latest earnings, is 10p. Then the PE multiple would be 10. But as I say, that's something we cover in another video. Now, um, is that the end of the story? Well, that's what they call basic earnings per share. The calculation certainly looks fairly straightforward. Just be aware that companies publish at least one other version, normally because they're required to in the UK, and that's called the diluted earnings per share figure. So just be aware that there is a thing called diluted EPS as well. Now, what that does is it says, well, actually, do we have the full picture here? Is this a true earnings per share figure or not? Um, and the full picture means how would this look if all potentially dilutive events in share price terms happen now? Um, and so what we're saying there is what if, for example, there are share options outstanding? Some of the directors may have the right to demand new shares as part of their pay packet. They haven't exercised that right yet, but what if they did? Would that change earnings per share? And do investors need to know the effect? So diluted earnings per share would say, well, actually, maybe existing options could create another, for argument's sake, 10 million shares. And if that's the case, one year's profit after tax for the last 12 months won't change, but the bottom of this formula does. So you can see that's going to pull down my 10p. Okay, so diluted earnings per share looks at things that might create more shares and therefore bring down this 10p per share. These events haven't necessarily happened yet, but that's thought to be useful to shareholders to get a picture as to what could happen to earnings per share. Other examples of dilutive events are warrants outstanding, pieces of paper that allow you to buy shares suddenly being exercised, or the conversion of debt into shares. Now what would that do? Well, if a company's got debt outstanding and the people who've lent the money 
have decided rather than have it paid back, they'd like to take some shares in the company instead, literally convert, what would happen is on the balance sheet, debt would disappear and suddenly the number of shares issued would rise. So here, what that would do is it would boost profit after tax a little bit because suddenly we don't have an interest charge on the debt going through the profit and loss account and it would increase the number of shares in issue. It would still on balance probably be dilutive. Now what that means is the 10p would shrink a bit. So to be honest for most investors diluted earnings per share is a matter of interest rather than being essential. Basic earnings per share is what a lot of investors track but just be aware that there are uh, one or two versions of it. Now, it's useful as a guide to performance over time. It's the basis for the price earnings ratio. Um, but is it flawless? No. There are at least a couple of problems with earnings per share and it's worth being aware of what they are. One of them was flagged recently by fund manager Terry Smith. Um, he's unhappy with earnings per share in one respect. So let's have a look at some, some issues here. So problems with the earnings per share calculation. Um, one of them, share buybacks. Now, a share buyback is a company that's got a lot of cash on its balance sheet thinking, do you know what, I'm not going to invest it. Uh, a lot of people are sitting around waiting for FTSE 100 companies to start investing again, but the climate may be too uncertain, so I'm not going to invest it. I can't sit on it because I'm not a bank. My shareholders are not paying me to just hold cash. I don't fancy paying out any more by way of dividends, so I'll simply buy back some shares. And you might say, well, that sounds like a reasonable strategy, but it comes with a twist, and earnings per share is that twist. Let's put those numbers back up again. So, my earnings per share figure was profit after tax of 10 million divided by 100 million shares. And that gave me 10p, or 10p per share. Share buyback, quite a cunning move this one, because look what happens. Basically, the directors write a check to buy back, let's say, 20 million shares. Effect on this ratio, profit after tax, still the same. One year's profit after tax from the profit and loss account. And anyone wondering about profit and loss account, uh, there is a separate video called What is Profit? describing that number in a bit more detail. But that won't change as a result of the share buyback, but this will. In very, very simple terms, you're going to decrease the number of shares outstanding by buying some back. And that is going to boost this number for no extra earnings. So in other words, it's quite a simple trick and the accounting rules allow it. The directors can achieve a kind of one-off boost to earnings per share through a share buyback, having not actually generated one bean of extra profit in the business. And that's just something to watch out for. Always worth keeping an eye on. Share buybacks will have that quite nice boosting effect on EPS. And there's another problem. Um, it is with the earnings figure being used. Because it's the profit figure after tax, lots of things have been deducted to get to it, and some of them are quite subjective. So for example, you've deducted the depreciation of fixed assets. That's essentially an estimate by the directors of how long they'll last, and a charge on the back of that in each year's profit and loss account to reflect the kind of wearing out of those assets. Amortisation does a similar job on intangible assets, such as goodwill. Now, those sound as waffly as they are, if you like, and they've been charged in arriving at the earnings figure used in EPS. So some analysts are not so keen on earnings per share for that reason. Um, and basically, the solution is you either try and sort of fiddle around with earnings per share to take out items you're not fully comfortable with, the more subjective ones, for example, that have been charged in the profit and loss account, or maybe you switch your target altogether. And that's why some analysts prefer something called free <coughs> cash flow per share. 
basically um, some investors, and I have some sympathy, this is quite a useful number, will switch their attention from earnings per share, saying, well, the earnings figure is, a, is really too, too flawed. It's based on a lot of accounting judgments, um, whereas cash flow is a little bit harder to manipulate. So rather than EPS, you get FCFS, if you like, free cash flow per share. Um, that's not something companies publish as a matter of course, and to bolt it together, what you'd need to do is go to the cash flow statement. That's the one that appears after the profit and loss account balance sheet. You would normally take the operating cash flow. That's the cash being generated by the, the heart of the business, if you like. Uh, and that's normally after things like uh, interest charges on debt. Uh, you would take that operating cash flow and knock off a little bit for essential capital expenditure on the basis that what's left is what the directors have to play with. It's the stuff that they can choose to some extent how they allocate. So free cash flow per share, something we'll pick up in another video, but essentially says actually EPS isn't really good enough. So instead, let's take um, operating cash flow, deduct a little bit for essential capital expenditure, on the basis that to run a business, you've got to spend something on maintaining fixed assets. And by the way, a proxy for that is the depreciation expense for the year, but only a proxy. Um, so we'll take out what we might call essential capex, and then we'll divide by the number of shares in issue. Maybe the 100 million again. And that will give us in pence cash flow per share rather than earnings per share. So, earnings per share is the one that's published, it's the one that people talk about a lot of the time, and frankly, it's not a bad guide to how a business is doing over time, and it is a key component of the price-earnings ratio. But, be a little bit careful, it can be influenced, should I call it that, by things like share buybacks, by decisions made about depreciation and amortisation in the profit and loss account, for example, and therefore you will find some commentators switching to another measure, free cash flow per share, on the basis that cash flows are a little bit harder to tweak um, by the directors, and perhaps it's a, a truer measure of the business's underlying performance.